Hi, my name is Wanda Paulson, and I'm the Advanced Care Planning Program Manager here at Essentia. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me today to learn about advanced care planning. I have been uh, with Essentia here for about 25 years, and through my time here, I've worked as a nurse in uh, a few different capacities. I've worked um, in the surgical intensive care units and in the hospital taking care of patients. I've also worked in the clinical setting where I've uh, worked with patients with chronic diseases such as heart failure. Failure. So through my experience in working as a nurse, I've seen a lot of people go through some hard times where they've been faced with some really hard decisions. And I really became passionate about advanced care planning and how important it is to uh, have proactive conversations about the kind of care someone wants before a crisis occurs. So in our time today, um, I'm going to be talking through some things that you might want to jot down some notes. So first of all, I'm going to encourage you to grab a pen and paper um, and through the course of our conversation, some things might come up that you want to take down some notes and maybe talk to your healthcare team about. So if you can do that. Also, if you have completed a healthcare directive in the past, or if you have a blank copy of one that needs to be filled out yet, I encourage you to have that handy to refer to as we go. If you don't have a copy of a directive already, I'll be describing how you can download or print off a copy. If you don't have a printer or you would like me to mail you a directive, I'll be sharing my contact information at the end. So feel free to reach out to me and let me know if you need a, a copy mailed to you or if you have any additional questions. Some people who are tuning in today have some health concerns of their own and some are interesting and in planning for their care in the future. I found that others that tune into our virtual training are caregivers and they want to be able to help their loved ones with this type of planning. So whatever your reason, I want to commend you for taking the time out of your day to learn more about advanced care planning and to begin the steps towards completing a health care directive. A lot of today's information is from our partnership with Honoring Choices and Respecting Choices. What we found is that the fear and uncertainty that came with the spread of COVID-19 is real and it's understandable. We have been called upon to support each other in new and different ways in many areas of our lives. Because of this illness and many of the news reports, more and more people started thinking about the kind of care they would want if they were to become seriously ill. Individuals and families who are at highest risk for complications and death from this infection may feel especially vulnerable, but many people are feeling some uncertainty and fear in regards to their health because of this illness. And although we can't eliminate the uncertainty about whether they will get sick or how sick they will become, by taking the time to join us today and proactively think about the kind of care you would want should you become severely ill, I hope to limit that uncertainty. Proactive planning also limits the uncertainty for your loved ones and for the clinical teams who can confidently create a plan that aligns with what matters most to each individual. So in our time today, we will define and discuss the term advanced care planning. We'll give you some time to reflect on your own experiences, values, and beliefs. We'll help you in selecting a healthcare agent, help you consider what some possible future healthcare decisions may be, talk about how you can transfer your wishes into a plan called an advanced directive and suggest some ways to share that plan. So when I'm speaking in person or to groups of people, I'm able to interact and I'm able to hear more about them. So as I go through the presentation today, I might give some examples of some things I typically hear from people when I meet with them just to kind of help you in that train of thought. Um, so when I meet with groups or individuals, I like to begin by gauging that understanding of what advanced care planning means to people. Some examples I usually hear are things like I'm, I'm getting things in order or I'm planning for the future. I'm making decisions about what I want if I get really sick. And these are all um, pretty common statements. And we're going to spend a little more time exploring what advanced care planning involves. For some people, one of the biggest barriers to completing 
the advanced care planning is some fear that comes with this. So to begin with, I just want to elevate that and just take a pause and allow you to think about if you have any fears or concerns that may have prevented you from completing a healthcare directive in the past. Some people have concerns about not understanding the medical choices, or other barriers have been concerns about who they should name as their decision maker. Others have expressed some concerns about how final this kind of planning feels. So we're going to take some time to talk through several things that I hope will help you to feel more confident by the time we're done today. It's important to know that advanced care planning is important for every adult age 18 and over, not just for someone we think something might happen to or those we consider to be at high risk of some kind of a, a problem. As my grandma always used to say, you just never know what a day is going to bring. So we say advanced care planning is a process for planning ahead for future healthcare decisions. It's important to understand that this is a process of communication and planning for those future healthcare needs. It's not a one-time event. Thoughts and wishes might change as you age or as your health changes. If wishes are not expressed, decisions are made for us, and those decisions might not align with our choices or values, and families and healthcare providers are left wondering what to do and if they made the right choice. This can cause a lot of family stress and burden. So as we start to think about advanced care planning, I want you to realize that many things can impact the way we make decisions. Our life experiences can really shape us. So as we start to think about our goals for care, it's important to think about any experiences you have had with someone you know who had a sudden illness or injury and was unable to communicate. So like I said, many have known, know, or maybe just heard of someone who in a who was in a medical situation where they were unable to communicate for themselves. Normally, when I meet with groups of people, I enjoy hearing their stories and the kind of things that have shaped the way they make decisions. Some people I meet with have talked about loved ones who have not been able to make decisions for themselves during a serious illness, or some have talked about how they have helped care for a loved one as they neared the end of their life. So I want you to think about your own story and your own personal experiences. What experiences have you had with loved ones or someone close to you, or maybe it was just an acquaintance you heard about? Think of an example of a time there was someone you knew who was in a situation where they were very ill or dying. As you look back on that experience, I want you to think about what did you learn as you went through that experience? or even thought through that experience. Some people express that these imp experiences impacted them very deeply and they start to really think about the kind of care they would want or maybe wouldn't want if they were the one to become seriously ill. So in your own personal experience, what did you learn as you went through that? And then reflect on any thoughts about the kind of care you would want if you were in that person's position. Maybe some of you don't have a lot of personal experience, but maybe as we've seen news reports about the coronavirus, or you've seen people who have been very ill or in the hospital in these news reports, have you thought about what you would want if that happened to you, if you were to become suddenly ill or maybe just injured? In addition to our past experiences, it's also helpful to think about the activities we engage in that are important to us and that give our lives meaning. So to help you get into this kind of thinking, I want to just ask this question. If you were having a good day, what would happen on that day? Who would you talk to? What would you do? I'll just let you think about that, for example. So the things that give life meaning are very individualized and they may change over time. For example, there may be a 28 year old who loves training for triathlons and cannot imagine life with a serious illness or an injury that causes a loss of independence. I've heard from people in their 60s who share examples of what they enjoy, such as walking the dog or being an active swimmer or being involved with their church family or community. 
I've heard from people in their 90s who talk about that they love to be independent and to be able to go out for lunch with friends. Or maybe it's just watching the birds in the bird feeder outside their window or getting a call from a grandchild to talk about their successes. Each of those life experiences require different levels of activity and participation, but all can bring great satisfaction or what we in the medical field sometimes refer to as quality of life. There's differences among people. One person may say life is only worth living if I can get out hunting and fishing or golfing. So being outside, walking, being mobile um, is very important. Someone else's greatest joy might be listening to classical music or being able to read, but they might not be able to walk or care for themselves, but being able to communicate or interact with their loved ones is what's most important to them. So what's acceptable to one person might not be acceptable to another. So as we think about what a good day looks like, what's important for us to live well, we think about what brings meaning to our life and what makes life most worth living. We can shift our thinking to what overall goals for our care would be if we were to become seriously ill and how what a good day looks like and what is most important to us can tie into that. So we'll explore that in a little we'll explore that a little bit more in the next few slides. To be able to incorporate someone's goals, values, and beliefs into their care, it's really important for us to understand what matters most to them as we just discussed. So another part of advanced care planning is those decisions that are going to be put into writing that we're gonna talk about. So today there's three things I really want you to consider. The first one is who would make medical decisions for you if you were unable to speak for yourself? Secondly, identifying if there are values or beliefs, whether they be personal, cultural, religious, or spiritual, that guide you and may help you or impact your treatment decisions. Thirdly, talking about what your goals of treatment would be if you were to become seriously ill. So the first one we talked about, choosing the decision maker or what we call the healthcare agent, is one of the most important decisions we encourage all adults to make. Choosing someone now who would make decisions for you in the future if you were to become ill or injured and unable to make decisions for yourself or communicate those wishes. It's important to understand that this person would only make decisions for you if you were unable to make your own decisions. It's also important to choose an alternate or two in case your first choice is not available. So let's say you have someone in mind. First of all, you're going to want to ask, are they willing? While family or spouse may seem like a natural choice, it's important to talk to them about this role and make sure they're willing to take this on. Some people actually choose not to have family as their healthcare agent. Secondly, you want to ask them if they're willing to talk with you about your goals, values, and preferences. So whoever you choose, you want to communicate with them so that they know your wishes. And then if there's any changes to your wishes as your life circumstances change. Third, ask if they agree to honor your wishes, even if they are different from their own. They need to understand that they will be speaking for you, not for themselves. Fourth, your agent should be someone who is able to make decisions during difficult or emotional moments. Obviously, if you were in a position where you could no longer speak for yourself or if something serious was going on and your loved ones or whoever you've chosen to be your healthcare agent was called upon, it's going to be difficult. But our goal is by having these proactive conversations and by getting a healthcare directive completed, you're just helping equip them. Um, it's really a gift to your loved ones and healthcare agents that they're just confident that they're honoring your decisions. It really takes a lot of burden off of them by having these conversations ahead of time. The more you share with your agent and other family members, the less stress, confusion, or potential conflict your loved ones are likely to face. It's also important to tell other family members who your agent is so there's no surprises and they can be supportive of your agent if they ever needed to serve in that role. And as I said, it's important to select an alternate or two. Sometimes uh, the person you care most about and that you've chosen to be your agent might be the same person in the same car accident with you. So if your first uh, agent isn't available, who should that second call go to? 
I want to mention that for some people, as I go through this conversation, um, I've met with people who do not have someone that they're close to or anyone they would trust to make decisions on their behalf. So if that's the case, it's really important that you have your wishes in writing and communicated with your medical team so they can know and honor your wishes if ever you couldn't speak for yourself. Each person I have met with has a story and we all have a story. And for care to be individualized, it really means thinking about your story and what matters most to you. So to begin, I want you to think about who or what helps you when you face serious challenges in life. When I meet with people and ask this question, I've heard stories of people who have been through some really hard times. And some people will say things like, I've just learned to be a strong person. So they just they just have that inner strength is what they've relied on as they've gone through life. Some people use this conversation to acknowledge their family or friends and those they are close to and have really relied on as they've gone through some hard times in their life. And they've taken this time to just really reflect on what that means to them and express that gratitude to those around them. I've also heard some beautiful stories from patients about their faith and spirituality or examples of how important prayer is in their life. So as you think on these things, think about what cultural, religious, spiritual, or personal beliefs that you have that might help you or impact the way you choose the care you want or don't want. And also think about which of these beliefs or traditions are important for you to discuss or clarify with your agent and others. Sometimes this just means looking at comfort. For some people, it's it's talking about what could we do to support you if you couldn't speak for yourself. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to put those kind of wishes into writing on the healthcare directive as well. I want to just acknowledge that caring for people involves caring for a whole person. It's not just the check boxes of treatment choices, because this kind of planning for a lot of people might be the first time that we really start to think about the fact that we're mortal. You know, some people really start to wrestle with questions about spirituality or their religious beliefs. And I really encourage you to reach out to your faith community or think about who you can talk to about your beliefs or any concerns that you might have, because this is a really important part of this kind of planning. The third thing to consider are your goals of care for medical care. If you experience a sudden illness or an accident that causes a severe and permanent brain injury, one in which it's unlikely you'll recover the ability to know who you are or who you're with. So as we move on to completing a healthcare document, this specific scenario is one that's outlined on the document. So I want to take a little time to just really think about this. I'm going to just read this situation for you. A sudden event, such as a car accident or illness, left you unable to communicate. You are receiving all the care needed to keep you alive. And I'm just going to take a pause right there. I want you to just make sure we're all on the same page about this scenario. So if something has happened, such as a car accident or illness, and you're unable to communicate, you're receiving all the care needed to keep you alive. What does that look like to you? When I'm reading that, what are you picturing that looks like? So for some people, when they hear this, um, they'll say things like, I, I see bells and whistles. I see monitors. I see tubes. I see um, wires. I see um, people running around. I see um, a lot of things being done to me. And, and so I just want to make clear that, that that is the situation we described. Um, an intensive care unit hospital kind of thing where things are being done to keep you alive. Maybe that's a breathing machine. Maybe it's um, IV treatments. Maybe um, a number of things are being done to keep you alive. But then this story goes on to say, the doctors believe there is little chance you will ever recover the ability to know who you are or who you are with. And so I want you to just think about that second part of the story. What does that mean to you? And what does this whole story mean to you? If this were to happen to you, what kind of things would you want to know about this situation? If you were in the situation and you were receiving all the med medical care to keep you alive and your doctors believed you would never regain your knowledge of who you are or who you are with, would you want to continue life-sustaining treatment? Or would you prefer care that focused on keeping you comfortable without using medical interventions to keep you alive?
So when I'm reading this scenario, some people interrupt me and they, they'll say things like, pull the plug before I even finish the scenario. They are very clear that if they were in a situation where they were receiving life support with little chance of ever recovering the ability to know their loved ones, they are clear they do not want to continue efforts to stay alive. But others hear this scenario and when I say that the doctors believe there's little chance you'll ever recover the ability to know who you are, they'll say, so you're saying there's a chance. And so this can really mean different things to different people. So this is where I want you to think back on your past experiences. Think back about your own health and what this situation means directly to you. And then think about what would you want if you were in the situation of where there's little hope of recovery. Would you want to continue the efforts to keep you alive no matter what? In other words, is staying alive as long as possible no matter what the most important thing to you? Would you want life-sustaining efforts, but maybe you would say for a limited amount of time, and then if there's no improvement to stop the efforts? Maybe you're saying, I would want any treatment to help me recover from an illness or injury, but if there was little or no hope of recovery, I would not want to continue those efforts. Maybe you're someone who would not want to have any life-sustaining efforts if you were in this situation, but you would, you're, what would be important to you would be to focus on comfort. I want you to just really take time to think through this scenario, what is important to you, what your goals would be in this situation, what you would hope for, and really think about how to communicate that to your loved one or your healthcare agent and to put it in the advanced directive uh, for your medical team to be able to honor. So we're going to take some time to talk through a couple other decisions that we would want to cover in a healthcare directive. Honoring Choices Minnesota has some excellent resources, but right now I'm just going to highlight um, the COVID-19 guide that can be found on the Honoring Choices Minnesota website. If you go to Honoring Choices, uh, you'll see the, I've circled in red, the COVID-19 um, tile to be able to click on to get to the COVID-19 um, advanced care planning guide. There's no possible way we can think of every single decision that might need to be made if you were to become seriously ill. But this guide is helpful to help walk you through a few key topics to consider if you had a serious illness or contracted COVID-19. For example, what are your thoughts on hospitalization? Would you prefer care in the home or in the hospital? If you prefer to go to the hospital, do you wish to receive intensive care and CPR attempts to prolong your life? Or do you prefer to receive care at home for skilled symptom management and care focus more on comfort? What are your thoughts on oxygen support? If it was recommended by your healthcare team, would you want oxygen support such as uh, the tube in your nose or maybe a mask over your mouth? But if that didn't work, um, if, if you were still having difficulty with your breathing, would you want mechanical ventilation? We know that lung failure is the main cause of death from COVID-19. So if you became critically ill, a specialized team would determine if a ventilator would help you. The patient information sheet that I'm talking about um, does go over some more information about a ventilator or in other words, a breathing machine um, and will help you think about your goals if you were to need that level of breathing support. Typically, advanced directives do not cover questions about your thoughts on things like breathing support. But during this time of coronavirus, I really have encouraged people to have a conversation about what their wishes would be in this situation, what would be an acceptable outcome, and what would not be acceptable if you were to need this kind of breathing support. This is also a good time to really think about your overall goals for care, as I mentioned. Um, I talked about, you know, is your goal to stay alive as long as possible, no matter what? Um, would you want to accept aggressive measures um, for a hope of recovery? Um, if I, I also mentioned for some people, if they have underlying health issues, uh, maybe they wouldn't want those aggressive measures. So um, one, one gentleman I met with, he just said it nicely that I'm just in heaven's waiting room. You know, he knew he, he had said things like, I lived a good life. Um, you know, I don't want a lot done. I just want to be comfortable. So to think about if you were to be in that situation, what would your goals be?
So if you have questions about the ventilator um, based on your underlying health issues, I really encourage you to have more conversation with your healthcare provider to really help you make some individualized decisions for that. On the Honoring Choices Minnesota website, there's also some information on CPR. On the advanced directive, there will be space uh, to make your choices known about uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which, as I'm sure you know, is an emergency procedure uh, commonly known as CPR. The CPR can be used to try to restart a person's heart or breathing. So as, as in the name of the word, cardio means heart, pulmonary means lungs, and resuscitation means to revive. But understanding CPR is an important part of advanced care planning. So I'm going to just read just a, a short excerpt from um, that handout just to um, before you're asked to start checking a box or making a decision on if you want it or not. I just want to briefly highlight some things that are covered on here. So the, it says, how is CPR done? And then it goes on to say, CPR involves pressing repeatedly on someone's chest and forcing air through his or her mouth. Sometimes emergency medical responders use electronic devices called an automated external defibrillator. The AED can check a person's condition and, if needed, deliver electric shock to the person's chest. This electric shock can help correct the person's heartbeat. So, the CPR might be those chest compressions, it might be that breathing support, it might be a shock, it might be some IV medications, likely it wouldn't be all of that. Um, CPR is most effective um, depending on your age. Um, for our patients that are very frail or very elderly, CPR is not going to be as effective or if someone's in the dying process uh, from an under underlying heart or an underlying issue. CPR is um, done to get that harder breathing going again, but it doesn't correct the underlying cause of whatever caused the harder breathing to stop. So CPR might lead to uh, the intensive care. It might lead to those aggressive measures to try to keep someone alive. So it's important to understand that CPR isn't just the, the two compressions and the person wakes up like we see sometimes on medical TV dramas. Um, and, and the success rate might really depend on someone's underlying health health issues. So if you have some questions about how successful CPR might be for you, um, if your heart or breathing were to stop, I really encourage you again to have that conversation with your healthcare provider who can really help guide you in, in making some of those treatment decisions based on your health. If you want CPR attempted, um, no matter what, there's certainly a spot where you can um, choose that option on the healthcare directive. So kind of shifting into that, getting those wishes into writing. Um, I, I won't be able to go through um, the different advanced directives from across our nation. Um, what's important is that you choose a health directive for the state in which you reside. Um, so there we have people complete a directive for the state which they reside, but there is reciprocity for care between the states. So some states have different questions that are required for their residents, um, and there may be different requirements for the witness signatures and those kinds of things. So it's important to choose the directive for the state where you live, um, but your care can be honored um, in different states with that document. Um, there are links to each of these sites on the Essentia Health website under Advanced Care Planning. Um, so I, I just want to encourage you uh, to, if you don't have a copy of a directive, um, here are some ways to be able to do that. I'll mainly use the Minnesota form for an example, but I know we've had people tune in from other states as well. So um, for most advanced directives, there are similar components. Um, there's a space for you to write your own personal information and also to choose your healthcare agent. Um, this form goes on to describe the powers of the healthcare agent. So basically you are giving this person the authority to make any medical decisions you would make if you could. This person might be agreeing to or refusing different treatments. It might mean that they are now um, activated to be your advocate and interpret what your wishes in the document mean to your healthcare 
It might mean to decide on what healthcare providers or organizations can provide care. It might be signing a release of information form to get records from one facility to another. So basically you're giving the authority to do the things you would do for yourself if you could. Um, but then there's a spot that allows you to grant some additional powers of the healthcare agent. For example, on the Minnesota form, there's space to initial things such as making decisions about the care of your body after death, or maybe you want this person to continue continue as your agent even if your marriage has ended. Wisconsin has some additional statutes that are really important to understand. And that form, there's space to initial to give your agent the authority to make decisions to admit you to a nursing home or community-based care facility, or to make decisions to refuse or have removed uh, feeding tubes or IV fluids. So I think it's important to understand that by giving your agent authority to make these decisions, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up in a nursing home or that you're going to have a feeding tube placed, but rather it's giving someone you know and trust um, the authority to be the person to um, help make these kind of decisions and be your advocate if these kind of decisions needed to be made. Um, I think it really helps emphasize how important that agent selection is, um, that you're choosing someone you trust to make decisions that honor your wishes, um, and, and how important having conversations with are ahead of time so they know what to do if some of these situations came up. On the advanced directive, um, you can make it as personalized as you'd like. So the Minnesota form has a full page dedicated to your hopes and wishes. I think it's really important to write down what matters most to you. And for those of you in other states, um, I think it might not be a bad idea to just look at the Minnesota form as a reference to just kind of get an idea of some of the things you might want to write down on your own directive if, if, if it's a little bit different, um, just to give you some more um, insight as to some of the things you might want to cover. On this form, it asks you to think, to write down things like the things that make my life most worth living, or my beliefs about when life would no longer be worth living. On the Wisconsin form, there's similar space to write what's important to you or clarify or elaborate on points or to make your wishes known. Um, this form asks about specific care instructions to meet my goals and preferences in certain situations. So as I mentioned before, um, not all directives ask things like if you would want additional breathing support or it doesn't go through a whole checklist of do you want this, yes or no. Um, so if there's things that are really important to you, such as the breathing support, or maybe someone has some strong feelings about if they would want a feeding tube placed or not, or if there's something that really jumps out at you that you feel you really want to make sure you're um, clarifying, make sure that in these spaces, this is where you're writing some of those specific treatment choices um, to honor your wishes. Most advanced directives will also ask you to speak to your comfort preferences. For example, some people want to be kept comfortable, even if that means they might lose the ability to communicate. Others express that they want to be aware and they want to be able to communicate with their loved ones and that they're okay being uncomfortable in exchange for being able to, to speak to somebody and they don't want to be heavily sedated. So really think about what would your choice for comfort be? Um, you might include information on things like your favorite music. Um, do you want warm blankets? You know, what would help you be most comfortable? What could we as a medical team do? What could your loved ones do to support you during that time? So um, think about what does comfort look like to you? There's also space to reflect on your spirituality um, and how we as a medical team can best support you in your time of need. So would you want someone to pray with you? Are there rituals that are important to you? Would you want a visit from a hospital chaplain or a call to your faith community? So if you couldn't speak for yourself or if you were nearing the end of your life, is there any personal messages you'd want to share or do you have any other wishes or instructions that you'd want to communicate? There's also space to choose if you want to be an organ donor. And if you want to give your healthcare agent the authority to request an autopsy or not. So with all of these choices, the conversation you have with your healthcare agent and loved one is an incredible gift to them. Once you've got 
your wishes in writing, once you've had time to walk through those medical decisions and really talk about um, the things that make life worth living and, and everything that's important to you for your healthcare, um, to make this a legal document, you'll need to have a witness signature. So as I mentioned, different states have different requirements. It's important to um, read closely on your document what the requirements are for a witness signature. In Minnesota, there can be either two witnesses or a notary. And for an example, in Wisconsin, it's not a notary. Instead, it's two, just two witnesses. So the witnesses don't need to know your personal business. They don't need to review the document and understand um, your choice for CPR. They just have to testify that you were the person that signed that document on that date. So during this time of COVID, we've had to become a little bit creative about getting the witness signatures. So um, one example was somebody um, called their neighbor and said, I have a, a legal document. I need a witness signature. Could you do that? Um, they went to their house, the, the neighbor stayed inside the house while the person signed it on the front porch while they looked out the window. Um, they set it on the porch, stepped back into the driveway. Um, the, the neighbors came out and signed their portion, set it back on the porch and went back in the house. Um, different ways to make sure that we're not um, putting anyone at risk for um, spreading any illness during this time. Um, some people have gone to the bank drive through um, and, and called ahead of time and made sure there was a notary and that they were willing to witness it over the um, screen at the bank and sent it through the tube and had it notarized that way. So there, there's a need for being a little bit creative during this time of COVID, but there's definitely ways to have a witness signature completed to make that document a legal document. Um, which is really important. So next, um, did you jot down any follow-up items? Were there questions that came up about treatment decisions related to your own health that you need to sit down with your medical team and, and ask some questions about your care and, and help guide some of those decisions? Um, I encourage you to set up a time to talk to your healthcare agent and family members to really talk about what this means to go over the document and just really give them that uh, confidence that they can honor your wishes if they were called upon to do so. Um, and, and just think through if there's any other questions that you have about uh, completing the document. After you've had a, a chance to complete it, this is really uh, important to communicate this plan. So I, I mentioned about getting that witness signature, but then you'll give copies to your healthcare agent and healthcare professional. So wherever you receive care, um, you'll want to make sure that they have a copy of your directive. So if you if you have your primary care provider um, at one um, organization, but you maybe see a specialist at another organization, you want to make sure that everybody has a copy of your directive so that it can be known and honored. Um, I mentioned how important it is to talk to the rest of your family and close friends so that they know who your healthcare agent is, they understand your wishes and can be supportive of each other if something were to happen. Um, and then keep a copy of your directive where it can easily be found. What I say is uh, for some of our uh, people in the Northland here, they're snowbirds and maybe they'll head south for the winter months. And if that's the case, just make sure you bring a copy of your directive along with you in your travels. When I mentioned about making sure you have a copy of your document wherever you receive care, here at Essentia, there's a few ways to get your directive into your medical record. If you have My Health, it can be uploaded through My Health. Um, you go under uh, Medical Record, Medical Tools, and then click on Advanced Directive, and the completed document can be scanned and uploaded that way. You could also fax it to 218-786-8977. That goes to our Health Information Services Department. So medical records would um, be able to get the document through fax. Or you could mail it to them at Essentia Health, West Annex, Cube 45 at 400 East 3rd Street, Duluth, Minnesota, 55805. Or if you have any in-person clinical appointments where you're, you're planning to be going in, maybe you have some lab work or, or you have an upcoming visit, you can certainly bring your document in with you and just ask that they scan a copy into your chart that way. I mentioned it's really important to review the document 
um, periodically to make sure that your wishes are current because advanced care planning is a process, not a one-time event. And as you go through life, those wishes may change as your circumstances change. So when you go in for that medical appointment and they they are bringing you to the room and they say, do you have a healthcare directive? Uh, you'll be able to say, yes, I sure do. But I want you to be thinking, does it still reflect my current wishes? So at the very least, we say with any of the five Ds. So um, some of you may have already completed a document. So just look through, does it, does it still reflect your current wishes? Or maybe has there been some changes where we need to have you update a new form? So at the very least, every decade of your life, you know, as we age, we might change our mind and what we want. So as we hit our 50s or 60s or 70s and so on, does my document still reflect what's important to me? If we experience the death of a loved one, you know, maybe we saw that loved one go through something that really impacted the way we look at the kind of care we want um, or um, what we would want at end of life. So if you experience that loss of someone close to you, it's really important to make sure your directive is still complete. Also, maybe that person was your health care agent and now you need to name a new um, advocate for yourself. If you go through a divorce, um, any change in relationships, um, so maybe that spouse is no longer the person you want to make decisions for you. Maybe you had previously chosen um, a friend, but now you have a child who's become an adult and you want that child to now be your agent. So any changes with relationships uh, would be important to update your directive. If you get a new diagnosis or a decline in your health, um, both really good reasons to make sure your directive is still um, current. I just wanted to point uh, you to that Honoring Choices Minnesota website um, at, that I referenced earlier. If you go to tools and resources, uh, you'll find some informational materials. Ones I really want to point out would be the um, information on the healthcare agent. Uh, this would be helpful for you to share with your agent so they understand what you're asking them to do and what their role and responsibilities would be. Um, it really helps introduce that conversation. Another one that would be really helpful to look at would be that CPR sheet I talked about and also the help with breathing um, would, would really help guide some of this conversation and help in completing the directive. So that was a lot of information to cover, and um, I, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and uh, learn more about Advanced Correct advanced care planning. I really hope that this has helped you to um, begin the process of completing an advanced directive. Um, there was one uh, woman I had worked with who uh, for years had said she had an advanced directive. And um, we realized that she, although she always said yes, that she did, we didn't have one on file. So then when I asked about that, she said, well, I have a whole stack of them at home. I've just never filled one out. So I, I hope that today um, this will help you go from the planning stages to getting it completed um, and encourage you to get that done and in your medical record. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or uh, your primary care provider, or if you see any specialists to have more conversation, we really encourage that um, as a process over time. So thanks for joining us and um, have a great day.